Welcome to the Tax and Subjects Podcast. I'm Ryan Norton. As you all know, data breaches are really big business for cyber criminals, and they seem to be happening more and more often. Um, in fact, just this week, Wired reported, and that's an online magazine, um, dedicated tech issues, but they reported that there was a massive database found filled with more than 700, or almost 773 million unique emails and passwords. And that's almost 2.7 billion combinations of emails with passwords. In other words, lots of people had their data stolen. And that event itself apparently arose from about 2,000 individual data breaches. So they reported that this week. That means, A, you need to probably change your password, and B, these things are happening very, very often. You need to be on guard. And that's why today we're joined in the studio by Drake Software Vice President of Internal Operations, Jamie Gibson. Welcome to the show, Jamie. Thanks, Ryan. Well, it's great to have you here, and we've talked about data security before, but it's one of those things that you need to talk about it all the time because it's always changing and it's always a risk. Absolutely. Um, so what we're going to kind of run through will be um, the risk of high-profile data breaches, like what I just mentioned, which is itself not one data breach, but a bunch of different ones that resulted in a massive yield of information. Um, so high-profile data breaches and then um, dangers from social media, because we're always on social media, and then just some scams that frequently target tax professionals. Okay, sounds great. All right, well, let's just launch into the first one. Um, what can fraudsters do with these huge troves of information they get from data breaches? Like, not just the one that Wired reported, but they had the Marriott um, Starwood. Yeah, the Marriott Starwood guest reservation data breach just recently. Um, so what, what can they do with that data? So um, a lot of times when there's a data breach and there's um, – there's personally identifiable information involved, PII, if you will, um, in, in, in involved, and there's no high consistency data involved, meaning um, they have my email address, they have my, my rewards number for a certain hotel, they have, um, you know, just high level information. A lot of us, um, see about those data breaches and say, oh, well, there's nothing actual actually identifiable in here. You can find my email address anywhere out there. You can find it on LinkedIn, you can find it on Facebook, you can find it on Twitter, you can probably just Google the company that I work for. But um, what a lot of people don't realize is how sophisticated the cyber criminals, fraudsters, if thieves, if you will, these days are, and that um, data breaches like those of the Marriott uh, Starwood breach are um, extremely dangerous in that what the cyber criminal is actually likely after is to build a profile based on the data that they have gathered from that breach. So um, for example, um, I stay at Marriott a lot. I travel for work a lot, um, dozens of times a year. And I my initial thought um, over the Starwood Marriott breach was that, oh, whatever, what are they going to actually get? And then I started thinking about it, and I thought, okay, so if I were a fraudster, what would I do with this information? Intelligence. The first thing I would do is say, okay, so um, member ID 12345 was in Washington, D.C. on June 4th. She stayed there for two days, and then two weeks later, she was in Omaha, Nebraska. She stayed there for two days. What were the conferences going on at that time at the Marriott in D.C., at the Marriott in Omaha? What information could this person possibly have? So cross-reference it to say, okay, so what was going on at those hotels at that time? Oh, it was a tax conference. Okay, all right there's my first bit of intelligence. So um, Jamie Gibson went to two tax conferences, more than likely because the other ones going on at the hotels at those time are not correlated in any way. So Jamie Gibson probably has some sort of uh, 
federal tax information on her machine, some sort of intelligence about actual tax filings. So what can I do with that? What, what can I do with that information? And um, the things that come to mind to me are um, I send a, the fraudster could send me a spear phishing email that's targeted towards somebody with tax information, maybe a perfect link to one of the blogs that I read every day with tax updates where I'm like, oh, okay, so I just got an email from a trusted blog. And it says, oh, my goodness. So with the government shutdown, um, the IRS has announced there will be no penalties on underwithholding, which is actually a real thing. Yeah. And so I, I want to click on this link. It's the first time I've ever heard of it. And it's, again, from a blog that I trust. And so I click on the link. I go to the website, and it says... Um, your Adobe Flash is out of date. I said, oh my goodness, that's right. I haven't updated it in at least six months. Yeah. I click on the link, I think it's a real thing. Next thing I know, I have malware and Trojans installed on my machine that allow the cyber criminal to have full access to my computer and all the tax data that may be on my machine. And if you're a tax professional who's actually actively preparing returns, and that's a thing too that I don't know a lot of tax professionals who have not heard the the drumbeat of they're targeting you. They want your data because you hold client data. Absolutely. And that means they can use that to file uh, fraudulent returns. Yes. They can actually log into your software and file using your software so that it's more trusted by the IRS. Yes. Make lots of money that yes. way. And we actually saw um, a scheme last year, and we talked about it on a former podcast um, from February of last year. I can't believe it was almost a year ago. I know. Where um, there were uh, tax practitioners who had fell victim to a phishing scheme and anywhere from one to five years before last year where the uh, cyber criminal had VPN access to their machine, they had key loggers installed, and the cyber criminal um, network sat there for one to four years and waited to see what kind of intelligence was on that person's machine that had been compromised. And what actually ended up happening was um, hundreds of tax practitioners that fell victim to this scheme, their um, entire client client database was stolen with high consistency information, which um, high consistency information includes um, data that that is actually real and associated with a taxpayer, whether it's EINs on a W-2, dependent socials, their entire filing history, their driver's license number, and then the cyber criminals took that data that they had stolen and uh, filed a tax return using that information that looked completely legit to the IRS and the state taxing authorities and received tax refunds. Um, and the, the scheme was so sophisticated that the IRS and a lot of the state taxing authorities couldn't actually tell when the real taxpayer filed what was the real return and what was the fake return. They can use the information from your database if you're a tax professional also to file for or to apply for loans to apply for credit cards and then it tanks the 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 client's um credit score because they're not paying those loans back and then you have to go look into well what do i do when i have an identity theft event and so there's a whole host of other things you have to do once that occurs if you're the individual whose information has been stolen and um if i'm the tax professional and i have had a breach what is the, the risk to, to me? I know that there's a risk to my clients, but also what, what would you say the risk to me would be? So the risk to you would be, um, well, f- first of all, um, all electronic filing originators, EROs, if you will, and tax practitioners um, are held to IRS Publication 4557, which requires you to have a data security plan. And part of that data 
security plan is best practices in safeguarding taxpayer data and actually how to report a, a, a breach or sus a suspected breach mm -hmm. at the tax practitioner level to the IRS and the appropriate authorities. Um, I would say that the legal ramifications are substantial, but the fact that tax practitioners and EROs who have not acted to secure their data and to secure their taxpayers' financial well-being, the impact to their business is devastating. They don't have a business anymore. Right. Um, I, in the event that I go to um, um, Joe Smith as my tax preparer, he has all my financial information, and I have trusted him with it. And um, Joe Smith did not take the actions to protect himself, to protect me, protect your clients, protect yourself, if you will, <laughs> the security right. summit saying. Um, I'm not, not only am I ever going back there again, I'm going to the local authorities, all the way up to IRS stakeholder liaisons to say, I went to this person that I trusted, and he didn't do what was legally required by Pub 4557 and ethically required by the fact that he holds my financial data to protect me. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do? So. so long story short, you need to make sure that you take all the necessary steps to protect data. And granted, sometimes even when you do, there could still be a breach, whether sure. it's not you, it may be an employee, but mm -hmm. in that event, if you have that data security plan in place, you know how to report it, you know how to hopefully uh, take care of that event and limit the amount of information that goes out of your business, or um, if you can give the information to your clients, they can take steps to limit the damage done to their financial health. Yeah, sure, and um, I, and I feel like as a, um, as a person goes, or a business goes through setting up, a security plan. Um, do it on your off time when you have time to think about it. When in the, it's not when, it's if. Yeah. Right? It's not if, it's when. Um, you're compromised. Um, you, in your panic mode, you have that checklist to go back to, mm -hmm. to say, okay, I've already done the back work and the prep work to, in the event that this were to happen, and now that it's happened. So my first line of defense is um, I'm shut off my Wi-Fi or uh, take my computer off of my hardwired router, for example. Right, yeah. So it's kind of a standalone computer. My second line of defense is I'm going to call the local authorities. My third is I'm going to contact my IRS liaison. My fourth is, is I'm going to contact my software provider. Yeah. And hopefully, um, as I say those in order, um, many practitioners and arrows and even the general public that is in the business of having PII, personal identifiable information, federal tax information, FTI, hopefully they have cybersecurity insurance. Right. So step zero, if you do, and if you don't, you better get some. Step zero is to call your cybersecurity insurance yeah. provider because they will guide you through all, all of those steps as to what one should do. As, as we've said in prior podcasts and one of the things that I always say when I present on, this, on these types of topics all the time is that it could happen to anybody. It could happen no matter how vigilant you are and everybody, we're humans. Right. The entire um, cybersecurity world, the entire... Um, um, goal of the hackers is to expose human error and we are humans in keeping in mind data security plans um, i know people are definitely human and they can make mistakes but what are some things that they can do to prevent these events so we've talked about uh, having you know security software on your computer but what are some of the, like if i had to have a checklist of the like the five things i should do today to secure my data, what would you recommend? Sure, so you hit on number one, antivirus and uh, security software mm -hmm. installed, keep it up to date. Um, number 
Number two is um, phishing emails. Yeah. So that's something that we all talk about often, and it seems like you've heard this so much in the security world. You've heard it. It's it, it's everywhere. Be vigilant. Be vigilant. Make sure that you're not falling victim to phishing schemes. Nearly 100% of uh, data breaches in small businesses are caused by phishing emails. And um, the... The sad part about that is the more we get the word out there about how to check for a phishing email, look at the links, look at the sender, type in the fully qualified URL into your browser, and um, and be vigilant. We People fall victim to them every single day, mm-hmm. every single day. So having your, um, your antivirus and security software up to date will help prevent if you fall victim to a phishing scam and you click that link and that link wants to install malware trojans so on and so forth um your security software will hopefully protect you from that yeah so the the third line of defense um and there is no one through five for me they they kind of all commingle they're all a best practice is passwords and for many, many years, we've all been told that your passwords should contain uppercase uh, characters, lowercase characters, numbers, and symbols. Mm-hmm. It should be between 8 and 15 characters, and you should change it every X number of days, where yeah. X number went anywhere from 30 to 180, not to exceed 180. And that the reason that the password should contain all of these different characteristics is because it's hard to hack right. a, a password that is consists consists of um, multiple types of characters mm. and characteristics. And what what um, the National Institute of Standards and Technology has found and. Um, that's NIST for short, um, is that that's actually not the case. That the longer the password is, regardless of what types of characters, numbers, symbols are in it, the longer the password, the harder it is to hack. So um, we're all used to changing our password every 30 days, 90 days, 180 days. And um, when a lot of us change our password, what do we do? So my password is Jamie, capital loves, kittens, one, exclamation (laughs) point. So uh, it says, so I'm logging into my bank account. I need to pay my bills that week. It says, you need to change your password. What am I, what am I likely to do? Change I'm to likely two. to just append something to mm-hmm. that password to make it easy to remember. Right. So it ended in an exclamation point. Now it ends in two exclamation points. Yeah. So um, what, what, what NIST has found is that um, we're all human we all follow patterns our brains work a a particular way so let's say my password for my bank account is the same as my password for my gmail account and my gmail account was compromised and so the cyber criminal the hacker goes in and says okay so i have jamie's information what am i going to do with that i'm going to find out where else she does business what other accounts she has and as, and i the hacker uses their the password that they got in a compromise and it says invalid password What's the first thing they're probably going to do? They're going to say, okay, it ended in an exclamation point. This is online banking account. It was Friday morning. Her bill's due. She's probably just going to add another exclamation point mm-hmm. to it. And unfortunately, that's true in those cases. <laughs> it is. So um, um, this came out with new guidelines that go into place um, this coming summer where it's not about changing your password. It's not about what what... Uh, alpha numeric and symbols you have in your password is how long your password is yeah and that you should not use the same password for every website that's a big one so my new password um from is going to be my name is jamie i love cats dogs chickens and i was born in april 
And I'm supposed to come up with 200 different variations of that, right? That's the trick. That's the trick. So um, one thing about passwords is to try to come up with a formula that makes sense to you. Mm -hmm. Hopefully it's not easily easily guessable, but again, (laughs) we're all humans to say, um, my name's Jamie and I love dogs, cats, chickens, and my car loan is at XYZ. Yeah type of thing so um passwords are kind of the keys to the kingdom as uh, as we all know um a best practice is to use a password manager yeah where um you have an app hopefully it's on your phone not on your desktop where um you have set up a password for all of your accounts through a password keeper and in order to log into those accounts you open your app and you type in your master password and say i want to log into my gmail and the application just does it for you so at least in those situations it's not just one password that gets you into an, an account it's your login into your phone your thumb your passcode mm-hmm. it's your master password to your password keeper and then it's the password that they've assigned to that account right. so just so. adding multiple different layers to get in to Absolutely. everything and like you said if you don't have a unique password if they hack my yahoo account and i don't if i have the same password for my Yahoo account that I have for my work login for my bank. They've literally gotten, just through that one, they've gotten everything. They've gotten everything. They've and gotten so. everything. Um, for number four, I would go with, especially for the audience that we're trying to reach today, um, and I present on this a lot as well, um, is that 27% of data breaches for small businesses are from um, internal sources, mm-hmm. your employees. And, I, and a, a question I ask often is, um, do you trust your employee with your life? Get, guess how many hands I've ever seen raised with that one? <laughs> nope, not a one. <laughs> I'm like, so do you trust them with your business? Nope, not a one. And then I say, how many of you have a single login into your network, into your computers, into your software? And I get a lot of this. Yeah. And I say, well, you don't trust them with your life. You don't trust them with your business. You just told me you do. Exactly. You just told me you do. Separate logins um, to networks, to Wi-Fi, to tech software, to accounting software, any type of software. Um, within a business is not only a best practice, it is a must do. It is a mm. must do. And and I really think that it hits home with a lot of the people that I present to because they don't really think of it that way. They don't think if I have a data breach and IRS criminal investigations or the State Bureau of Investigations, FBI, what have you, depending on how substantial the, the, the breach was, comes into my business, and we all use a shared login, I can't, I look as, as culpable as the next person exactly. because it, there's nothing to tie back to the person that actually caused the data breach, stole the data. Mm-hmm. So um, separate, separate accounts is definitely number four. Yeah. Definitely number four. And number five, you're probably going to be surprised about this, physical security. What do you mean by that? By physical security, I mean um, um, keeping your file cabinets with paper that have federal tax information and personally identifiable information locked. I mean locking your office door. I mean locking your business door. Mm-hmm. Um, and we all we, we all think of attacks starting from the computer world. Um, many. Many of the more recent schemes that um, the IRS criminal investigations have discovered are caus- caused by things such as dumpster diving. The and oldie that, and the goodie. The oldie and the goodie. <laughs> and that can go anything from you throw things in the recycle without shredding them. Yep. The the building janitor in a, spare, in a shared office space comes along. Literally throwing it in the dumpster. Oh, my goodness right mm-hmm. leaving papers on your desk and your and your desk 
your office doors not locked and so on and so forth so um i just like i said all five of those things to me are all best practices there's not none of them should be disregarded all of them should be followed but um we're gonna go back to passwords yeah keep them safe absolutely and keep your user account separate what do you say to people who um, write down their passwords? Stop. Exactly. I say stop. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> what are you doing? What are you thinking? So, and that's part of what I was talking about, about the password changes and the yeah. new guidelines from Nest is that if I have to have a different password for 70 different websites and it's changing all the time and my business it's what's today january that is the 18th 18th january 18th i just had to change my password into my tax software and i have a hard time remembering passwords i'm gonna write it on a sticky i'm gonna stick it on my monitor <laughs> i'm gonna do it and again going back to physical security yeah so somebody walks in my office the 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 housekeeper what 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 have you and there's my password right there yeah and so um keeping passwords safe is is definitely a challenge we face as the human race right and <laughs> like personally i have outside of my work i have probably five emails because i try to keep my stuff in sure. separate silos right like Absolutely. Keep my, my business is in this email whether it's financial whatever and then my my personal correspondence is with this one and so you know I know yep. people do that, and yep. if you share the same, again, if you share the same password across all of those, Absolutely. it's easy to get into it, but it's hard to remember as that number grows. So the ones that are easy to remember, because like the original password you were talking about, the it was eight to 15 characters. Mm -hmm. They've got capital, lowercase, all that, the special characters. Those were hard to remember, too, and that's mm -hmm. a, that was a huge hurdle, because mm -hmm. you're sitting there, if you can't write it down, you're trying to remember in your head, like, do I do a memory palace? How do I remember how to do all this? Sure. And and so that's where it bred a lot of that. I'll just change it. I'll use the same password for everything, but it just changed sure. like one number. Sure. And to your point, you know, I like to be transparent. I locked myself out of my joke account the other day. <laughs> I've had the same I've had the same password for thirty days, but for some reason my brain was on my last password. Mm-hmm. It was on my last password, so I locked myself out of my Drake account, and I'm trying to log into work, and so I'm contacting Infosys, and they're like, well, you have to go through this process, and so I'm sitting there thinking to myself, what am I, what am I going to do to not do this again? There's no <laughs> silver bullet. There is no, yeah. no, there's nothing I can tell any of you that says, this is how you're going to avoid getting the wrong password or reusing a password. Mm -hmm. So, like I said, we all need to retrain our brains to go back to creating patterns that are unique to us. Right, those big pass phrases. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, so we've covered um, the risks posed by these high profile or even just direct attacks on your um, business, mm -hmm. data breaches, mm -hmm. uh, some things you can do to prevent that. Well, you know, I'm, I've had a long day. I'm going to hop on Facebook. Oh, look, Bill just did one of those surveys. Those are so cool. I wonder which house in Harry Potter I'm in, too. I guess I'll just go do that. I'll take that, I'll take that survey. Is that a good idea? So <laughs> the short answer is no. <laughs> the long answer <laughs> is that I have been I have had this unbelievable urge and I have fought it up to this point to put a post on my personal social media that says PSA as in public service announcement. Please stop answering these quizzes. <laughs> what are you thinking? What are you thinking? I'm thinking I just wanna know. Am am, am I a Slytherin? Am Absolutely. <laughs> my m my favorite one that I see going around right now is, what does my partner answer? And then people put the truth in the prince. So what's the problem with that? Well, I, you what, know, what do you think profile. the problem is? <laughs> if I'm a, if I'm a criminal, I'm trying to build that profile we talked Absolutely. about earlier. 
Absolutely. I'm so glad that Bill just told me everything I need to know. Absolutely. So um, as as we talked about um, data breaches like the Marriott one where they don't have any actual socials or anything like that. But as I said, they've researched me. They've researched why I was at the Marriott on those certain dates. And now they know that I'm in taxes. They don't know what tax software I use. Right. However, they know my email address, and they can probably figure out what my security questions are in the event I have answered or posted a quiz that Mm -hmm. we were talking about earlier. Um, I was actually super shocked. Um, I had, um, again, I'm transparent. I locked (laughs) myself out of one of my accounts the other day. And it said, what's your first car? That's like the most common question Mm -hmm. on these quizzes. And so I'm like, should I make up what my first car was? Should I make that up? And a lot of people actually do that. They Mm -hmm. they set their security questions up with the wrong answer, but then they can't remember what their wrong answer was. But but when you answer, when you take these types of quizzes that have personal information about you, especially when it goes back to, to stuff that you would set up for, For your security questions, what elementary school did you go to? What street did you grow up on? What town was your first job in? Where was your first job? Hello, LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. So uh, you see what I'm saying here. So so especially um, if your profile is public in social media, which mine is somewhat public, not not really, but a lot of people, um, when they make a post, when they answer a quiz, when they s- put a picture of their kids on there, they, the anybody who knows their name mm-hmm. can go to their social media site and glean that information. Right. And as we've talked about in prior podcasts is that um, in the past, um, cyber criminals, fraudsters, it was easy to get into somebody's account. Um, now they know they have to put work into it and they are more than willing to oh, take yeah. your email address, to take your occupation, to go to LinkedIn, to go to Twitter, to go to Facebook, to go to Instagram, figure out what they can learn about you in order to become you. Right. So. Don't answer those quizzes. Don't answer those quizzes. Don't post a whole bunch of stuff on Facebook that you might be able to use in those security questions. Absolutely, absolutely. And as we've talked about before, I'm a huge social media fan. And it's like, it's like, because (laughs) I want to answer those quizzes. I know. Like I really want to do it because they're super fun. And I, and I super want to ask my partner, Jack, um, so what was my first car? And he's like, I don't know, a Saturn. And I'm like, how can you not know me better than that? <laughs> I'm exposing you to the entire Facebook world. <laughs> They're fun. They're they are. Fun. They are. And people either don't know or don't think about what can be done with that information. And even how that ties back into where they can use that to get not just into your email, but your business accounts. Your business accounts. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Jamie, before we go, um, we've covered, you know, a bunch of stuff about security, uh, data breaches, best practices, social media, fun, but can be a risk. Sure. What are the scams that people need to be on the lookout for in 2019? Well, unfortunately, the new ones, we're not aware of them yet, right? That's right. But um, past scams that are still kind of huge and still floating around out there are um, the what they call the whaling scheme, mm. which is um, where a... Um, executive of a company is targeted to give up financial information such as W-2s, mm-hmm. 1099s, um, depository accounts. Um, right. So um, other things to, to be aware of is um, getting attachments in your email from who you think is somebody who's trusted. So a lot of tax preparers and EROs right now um, in this day and age, uh, people don't want to go into the office, into a tax preparer's office to, mm-hmm. to do their tax return. They want to scan in their W-2s, their 1099s, social security cards, and they want to email them to their tax preparer, sign their return electronically, easy peasy done. 
And what what we've seen a lot, um, and I, I, I shouldn't say a lot, what we've seen some of is um, EROs and tax practitioners receiving emails from who they think is their customer. So Joe, Joe Smith again, he mm. receives an email from Jamie Gibson attached to all my tax documents for this year. I've been a customer of Joe Smith for the last seven years, and Joe doesn't want to inconvenience me. He doesn't right. want to call me. Obviously, I sent him an email. He opens those attachments in there, and it's not actually from Jamie Gibson. It's a script that installs again. Trojans, malware, malware. and um, Joe Smith's computer is taken over. Um, some some other things that we're seeing right now um, is from prior breaches, uh, a tax practitioner or ERO's client list has been stolen, and what the fraudsters are actually doing is they go to a do-it-yourself product with that high consistency data mm -hmm. they file a tax return with a purposeful invalid date of birth they send the tax return through with an invalid date of birth to see if they get a reject code from the irs or state taxing authority that says this is an invalid date of birth or this tax return has already been filed tax return hasn't already been filed it's an invalid date of birth Foster goes to another do-it-yourself prepare with the ERO stolen information, knowing that the return has not been filed because they got an invalid date of birth. They file the tax return through that DIY provider with the correct date of birth, high consistency data, they receive the tax refund. I mean, they're terrible people, but that's genius. It's, that's it's, why I said... The, the the cyber criminals, they know they have put effort into it now. They're smart. Mm -hmm. They're smart. That's a scheme that's pretty freaking interesting to me. Not as, not as interesting as the ERO scheme last year that we discussed, but it's smart. They yeah. know how to play the system. They know how to get, how to file a tax return, knowing it's going to be rejected for either already been filed or the date of birth doesn't match that taxpayer and that social security number. So then they know, where can I get a refund from? Well, I obviously can't get it from the one that's already been filed, but mm. I know the right date of birth. Yeah. I'm gonna hop software in the DIY space and the on the World Wide Web, and I'm gonna file the high consistency looking legitimate tax return, and they're probably gonna get the refund. Be careful out there. Absolutely. That's going to be it for today. Okay. Jamie, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me, Ryan. We'll see you all on the next Taxing Subjects podcast.